so, uh, you know, whenever I come back to this student organization that I used to be involved in, hold on, let's pause. Okay. So, you know, it's always a, a reason, or it's a good excuse for me to sort of reflect on what was school like back when I was here as a student versus now, and what were computers like, and what was programming like, and all that stuff. And I started thinking about how fast computers are today compared to how they were uh, back then. To be very specific, back then was uh, 1989 to 1993 or 4-ish. Uh, and I say ish because I sort of dropped out. I sort of faded away from the school at some point. Um, but I showed up in, in fall of 89. Uh, so back during that period, sort of toward the end of that period, uh, this was sort of what would have been considered a, a badass computer at the time. This is the uh, CM5 connection machine. Um, there was one of these at Berkeley in 1992. Uh, I, being an undergrad, was not privileged enough to have any access to this thing at all. Right? This thing was reserved for graduate students and faculty who were doing parallel alg algorithm research. Um, and, you know, basically the way it works is this is just a really tall box full of uh, tons of cores. I'm not sure how many there are per box. I think it might be about 100. Um, this is an actual photo from a really ancient uh, EECS uh, website of the, the actual box that was here. Um, I believe this one was in Evans Hall. So this, is, this all dates back to before this actual building was built, right? So we did most CS stuff in Evans or Cory at that time. Uh, Okay, so, but the way this computer was designed was so you could string a whole bunch of them together and network them and get a faster and faster computer, right? And so something of this size, uh, this is a, probably a PR uh, shot from Thinking Machines, something of this size would rank as a top supercomputer in the world. Here's the June 1993 list of the top supercomputers in the world, and the top four are all connection machines consisted of a bunch of those boxes strung together, you know. Um, and you can see how fast they were uh, at Los Alamos, which was probably used for simulating nuclear explosions or something, who knows. Uh, 131 gigaflops. That, that sounds fast, right? Uh, okay, so this phone that I'm holding right here, very portable, a lot more portable than that giant computer box, is, if you look up the stats on the web today, 172.8 gigaflops, which would make it easily above the top computer on this list. Now, there may be a little bit of confusion involved in here because I think this is a little bit of a PR number, and it's it's a 16-bit floating point gigaflops, maybe. So you could divide it approximately by two, in which case you've only got 85 gigaflops, at which point you're a sad number two on the top computer. <laughs> <laughs> the June 1993. So things are really fast. Uh, and that's just a phone, right? And think about all the computers we have access to today. This laptop that I'm running this presentation on, which is not doing much right this second, it's showing this very boring image, is way faster than this phone, right? Um, I can show you how much faster it is, actually. I have a benchmark here uh, that I'm going to run. Uh, so opening this image, and uh, let's see what the... Uh, uh, okay, eventually, wait, can I, can I, no, okay. So that took about, I don't know, 10 seconds or something. I didn't time it to pull up this really stupid image. Um, and everything here was hot and in the cache and stuff. I didn't, I was going to reboot before the presentation to get like the full experience of it being much slower, but I didn't want to reboot because now there's a Windows update pending and God only knows if this computer would actually successfully reboot or if the presentation would have to be scuttled, right? Um, now, so what's going on here? Like, the job, oh, by the way, this program has the audacity to install itself as the default viewer for all bitmap files when you install it. So you double click on an image in Windows and that's the experience at best, right? It actually was worse a couple weeks ago for weird software complexity reasons that I don't understand. Now the very ironic thing is the very first thing that this program does is display a freaking image. Okay. Watch how fast this comes up. Boom! And then it's sitting there doing a bunch of garbage I don't care about forever. <laughs> and then eventually I sort of see an image and I still can't like do, okay, now I can do something with it. By the time this panel on the right comes up, it's done. So 
that's, uh, that's not great. That's not great. That's all I'm going to say about that right now. Um, so, so the laptop I'm running this from is potentially much faster. But in practice, it usually is not that fast. In practice, the experience of using programs on a laptop or on a phone, especially if you're on Android, is, is really not great. So now the thing, the warning that I have for you is that the rest of this presentation is not particularly lucid or well thought out. It's just me being angry about a lot of things. <laughs> so, um, and we'll, do, we'll leave room for Q&A at the end, and maybe one of the questions will be, well, what was the point of all that? But I'll try to make it at least clear enough that you understand what I'm saying and admit all the frothing at the mouth. Uh, so I'm talking about the mid-90s, and that was the rise of the web. You know, So web, the, the World Wide Web did not exist when I showed up in fall 1989. In like 1991, I don't re remember exactly, one of my friends, Pei Wei, was working on a web browser when like nobody knew what that was, even in the computer science department here. It was a very niche thing, right? Toward the middle of the 90s, you started having the web become a more widespread thing. Back then, you could click on a web page and it would take a second and open, which is about the experience of the web today, especially if you don't run an ad blocker. Now, there is one difference, which is that we had way more general internet outages back then, like. I don't actually know what happens at this school, but you know, back then, the internet might go out for like a minute in the middle of the day for no reason. Okay, so maybe that still happens. It doesn't happen at my office very often. But you know, aside from that, the experience is about the same. And why is that? Like, this is bigger than the biggest supercomputer in the world, and yet the web is still kind of lame. We do draw more stuff, but if you think, if you were to extrapolate that level of amplification of computing power, like the web should be amazing and instant, right? It should respond to you immediately. It should feel, if any of you guys have tried like a VR rig that is running at 120 hertz and has all sorts of crazy tricks going on to minimize latency, like that's what the web should feel like. I mean, maybe in 2D, but it should be that responsive and it totally, totally isn't, right? Why? What, what the hell are we doing, right? So here's an interesting question someone asked on Quora. Uh, why does Twitter need 300 employees? I'm just curious. What is the organizational breakdown, blah, blah, blah? Because it seemed crazy when this was posted that Twitter had 300 people to do such a simple website. OK, this was a few years ago, though, because Twitter is a lot bigger than 300 employees. Um, well, first, let's, let's read the answer that was given. and I've, I've, erase the name of the person who posted this, but it's somebody who worked at Twitter. And she said, well, it's about half engineers, not including operations. The rest is sales, designers, product managers, accountants, legal, recruiting, and HR. I said, how big we're going to be, as big as we need to be. Edit. I remember my housemate was once incredulous as to why we needed so many engineers for such an apparently simple site. One, Twitter's not as simple a website as you think. Keeping Justin Bieber from dominating the trends and user recommendations are two examples of non-trivial features. Two, like Facebook, the core functionality is simple, and most people could do it in a weekend, but getting it all to work at scale is hard. I firmly believe we need every single engineer we have here, and we need more. Ooh. Apparently they did. Um, uh, we'll keep going into this explanation. Uh, here's a rough breakdown of where our engineers are. Internal tools, including the Help Center, the Twitter admin, the AB testing framework, etc. Infrastructure, performance, Rails, tweaking, writing, job demons, API platform, relevance, whatever. I'm going to go on. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But it just lists a breakdown of like all these different things that one could do. <coughs> we won't analyze it yet. Here's Twitter now. Uh, well, th this was Twitter maybe around their peak. They just laid off uh, about 350 people. So they're probably toward the mid 3000s. Um, and you can say, wow, that explanation really was, uh, really was, uh, convincing, even though I didn't read the whole thing, you know, there are all those things that you have to do. I hadn't, hadn't thought about that. Uh, but you know, you can look at examples of some other companies. Um, so for example, SpaceX is around 4,500 approximately employees, and they build and launch rockets <laughs> into space and then land them on the ground, which has never, and, and like dock with the International Space Station. How is Twitter <laughs> remotely of that same scale of effort, right? It, it isn't, I, I claim, right? I've been on Twitter since 2010, 
which I felt like a little bit of a late arrival to Twitter. I was putting it off, like a lot of other people in the games industry were on it at that time. Um, let's look back at this graph. In 2010, they had 130 employees in January 2010 when I joined. I can tell you from my day-to-day -day use, it's basically the same website. It just has a few more things that I really don't want, right? <laughs> but they've gone from 130 people to 3,900 people about, pro let's assume that it's about half engineered. It's probably more than half back here, right? Because they haven't like staffed up to have sales and all that. But uh, call it 130 engineers to 2,000 engineers to, to still do basically the same thing. It's a little bit crazy. What is happening? Um, so you could say, well, maybe they're building a very high quality product. But I can tell you that's really not true. So yesterday while I was working on this talk, right, I made a tweet and I misspelled a word, which happens all the time because you're typing really fast. You can't edit tweets. So I deleted it and I said, oh, if I delete it and paste it in really fast and fix it, then I'll get it out and it won't, it won't go to that many people. So I deleted the tweet and then I was trying to paste it in and edit in the box. And this your tweet has been deleted thing kind of pops down from here and it's covering the box where you need to type that it wouldn't go away. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And I kept trying to make it go away. I tried scrolling down on the page. I eventually had to reload the page and then paste the thing. And by then my whole like I'll slip in the quick change tweet, uh, it, it was really a little bit of a lost cause at that point. So all those engineers are, are not working on software quality as near as I can tell. Um, the software is still basically terrible, right? It's basically the same thing it does. It was in 2010. It does a few things a little bit better. It does some things a lot worse. Now they try to move buttons around on you, like they put that moments button up, up there where you used to click all the time in order to try and get you to click on it. So a lot of those engineers, it was probably 10 people's job just to move that button. I mean, I don't even know when you have that many people what they're doing. OK. <laughs> So one theory is, okay, maybe it's really this complicated. Maybe, okay, you've got to do all that stuff. That's a lot of people. But you know what? I just shipped a freaking video game on a couple of platforms. And if I were to list out all the different things we did to ship that, it would be a really long list. I could certainly make you a lot longer list than this if you're trying to compete for a length of list, right? Like, freaking internationalization. I did internationalization for 16 languages on this game, including programming for freaking Arabic, which was really annoying. Because um, sorry, sorry if people speak Arabic, but the thing that makes it annoying is it's right to left, whereas most languages we deal with are left to right. And like, so every screen, it, never mind. I won't go into it. The language itself, I'm sure, is very beautiful. But when you've got like two weeks to make it work, it's like, oh my god. Um, fortunately, well, there are some libraries that help you a lot with that. Uh, but the, the point being just, you know, like, OK, internationalization definitely is a thing you have to do. But why do you need? a department for that. It, do, it doesn't, like, especially an engineering department, it doesn't make sense. All right, so alternative thesis to the fact that it's this complicated is like maybe people at Twitter don't really know how to program that well. <laughs> um, that, that, is, that is not the most incendiary thing I'm going to say at this talk. So. <laughs> They're not really a 